welcome to our online service from Solid Rock Drogheda. We do have a physical in-person service taking place at 11 o'clock this morning at our premises at Bally McKenney Road. Uh, but if you can't make it for that, we're delighted that you joined us for this online service. We're going to have some worship. We're going to have a special song and then uh, we'll look at the word of God together. With all creation 
You know, we first started having these online services uh, for, through Solid Rock back in March 2020. And then, of course, it was a response to the pandemic and to the lockdowns that were in place at that time. And then once the lockdowns finished and we were able to reopen church services once again, uh, we still continued with the online services and we are still doing that. We're still continuing with it. But for for all oh, for hundreds of services now i've been opening them up by saying uh we have services today at 10 o'clock and at 12 noon but we started a little bit differently today by saying we have service this morning at 11 a.m because we have made a decision in draw over these summer months of july and august to uh, have one service instead of two to cram everybody in together we were still allowing plenty of room uh, for people to distance and everything else but we just feel the lord saying it's time for god's people to start coming together again now we still want to facilitate people who can't be with us in that service and that's why we're continuing with all of our online ministry um but if you can join us on a sunday at 11 o'clock we would love to see you because there is something beautiful about us all coming together you know in psalm 133 uh, just only three verses in the psalm. It says, how good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. It is like precious oil poured on the head, running down on the beard, running down on Aaron's beard, down on the collar of his robe. It is as if the dew of Hermon were falling on Mount Zion, for the, there the Lord bestows his blessing, even life forevermore. I think as Christians, we know that we cannot do things in our own strength. We know that we cannot do things under our own empowerment. That's why as Christians, we talk about this thing that we call the anointing of the Holy Spirit, God's power being poured out upon us and symbolized in the Old Testament by the oil by which they anointed a priest, a prophet, a king to show the presence of God necessary and still continues to this day in language, not just in churches, but also in even ceremonial events like the coronation of the king over in, uh, in the United Kingdom. But uh, we need God's anointing. We, needs, we need God's presence. Just doing all the man-made stuff that makes up church just uh, singing the right songs and and preaching messages and all of that that that'll never cut it without the presence of the holy spirit we need the holy spirit and the fact is the holy spirit according to psalm 133 the holy spirit has poured out his anointing is poured out upon his people when we are in unity together it's not a solitary pursuit you know, the day of Pentecost took place. It says they were all gathered together in one place or they're all, in some versions say, they're all gathered together in one accord. 
And it says, then the Holy Spirit was poured out. There's a great sound like a rushing mighty wind and tongues of fire came down and descended on them and touched them. And they were filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. Some people want the tongues of fire without having the being all together in one place in one accord. Now, like I say, if you can't make it to our active, to our physical gathering of worship, we're delighted you're joining us uh, online. But I do want to say this, that when we have the opportunity to fellowship with other people in person and we don't do so, then we're not in the best place we can be. If you can't be with other people, if you can't meet with other people, and I know there's people because of age, because of infirmity, because of sickness, because of work schedules, aren't able to meet with other people. Well, I want to tell you, God will pour out his spirit on you. But if you have the opportunity to meet with other believers and you spurn that opportunity, you know, we shouldn't therefore just say, oh, God's going to pour out his anointing on me. Because God wants his people to be in one place with one accord. And that's why I'm so excited about uh, through these summer months, having one service in Solid Rock and having so much of the church family uh, together instead of spread across two services. And we're looking if there's ways that we can continue that after September. Where a lot of people are away in the summer. Um, we have a lot of people from different countries who go home from the summer. But uh, we really want to see if there's a way we can keep that, even if it means cr a bit closer fellowship, cramming it a bit tighter together, that we can have the, most of the family together in one service. You see, we need one another. Yesterday, we, uh, we, a few of us went to the cinema. We went to the cinema in Drogheda to see the movie Jesus Revolution. And uh, I'd heard about the movie. I hadn't actually seen it. I was encouraging all these other people to go to it. I arranged the booking with the cinema and everything else. Uh, but I hadn't seen the film myself. So as I was going in, I thought, oh, oh gosh, I hope this is worth it. I hope this doesn't turn out to be a real dud. Because to be honest, there have been some lousy Christian movies made over the years. But I'll tell you, this was not one of them. It was a, it was a great story. A true story, a great story that dealt with people whose names I know, whose books I've read. People like Chuck Smith of Calvary Chapel. Uh, people like um, Greg Laurie, who is uh, the pastor of the Harvest uh, Harvest Church. And, uh, you know, as I, as I watched this story unfolding, it was a great story. But it was not a fairy story. You know, it started off, it was almost like a fairy story. This pastor meets a, a hippie. Uh, the hippie starts, uh, uh, to, uh, this is way back in the in the late 60s. The, the, and the hippie starts uh, sharing about how all these people that are, they're living in a counterculture are looking for reality, looking for God, as he put it, in, in drugs and in all kinds of stuff. And they were looking in the wrong places and they weren't finding it. And if only a pastor would work with me to, we could present Jesus to them. And that's what they did. And that's what really happened. And people were coming to Christ. And I have to say it was absolutely great. It was great to be sat in a cinema in Drogheda where 30 years ago they would never have dreamed of allowing such a film to be displayed. And seeing there on screen people giving their lives to Jesus, being baptized in the ocean, all sorts of stuff, uh, receiving the power of the Holy Spirit. I mean, it was, it was great stuff. But like I say, it was not a fairy story because it didn't just continue with everything being sweetness and light. It focused in on some of the divisions that took place. And in particular, one of the characters who was key to that early development of the Jesus movement was a guy called Donnie Frisbee. And Donnie ended up becoming separated. Donnie ended up feeling that uh, he, he, was so, he was more important than other people in what was happening. And uh, when the glory, of course, should have gone to God. And Donny Frisbee did backslide and backslid very badly. His marriage fell apart. He, he got involved in gross immorality. Uh, and uh, thankfully, he did find his way back to the Lord before his death. But uh, you know what? It, it, Donny Frisbee's story is not a pretty story. It's of somebody that was undoubtedly used by God, but allowed themselves to be sidetracked for a good portion of their life. Uh, by, by sin and by being separated from the rest of their Christian family. You see, we need one another. When we think we don't need one another, when we think we're good and important enough with just God and me, we can do it. And we think we don't need one another. We can end up in a place 
that it can be quite dark and that did happen with Donnie Frisbee and I was personally really really glad that the movie didn't dwell on the sin in great detail or anything like that but it did make it clear that this was not a fairy story that there's you know and following Jesus is not a fairy story and being in church is not a fairy story there are difficulties there are stuff that we need to work through but we have to do it together because God moves when we are together it's the power of one Jesus said that he and his father were one and he said that the church is to be one in the same way that he and his father are one and that really reminded me of a passage of scripture which is right at the end of 2 Corinthians. So 2 Corinthians chapter 13. Now we're probably well used to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 Corinthians 13 is the passage always gets read at weddings. All, all about love. Love is this, love is not that, all, all the rest. It's a great passage of scripture. 2 Corinthians 13 is the last chapter of second corinthians and right at the end of it the last four verses verses 11 to 14 it says this finally brothers and sisters rejoice strive for full restoration encourage one another be of one mind live in peace and the god of love and peace will be with you <coughs> greet one another with a holy kiss all God's people here send their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And there Paul wraps it up. Now, when I, when I read those verses, I'm reminded of a TV program, that, uh, a detective program, that you, TV show that used to be on many years ago. And some of you probably remember Columbo the the detective in always wore this uh, raincoat and he had this thing he sort of was shambolic he's sort of arriving to interview suspects at their homes or wherever else and uh, and he just looks like he has no clue what he's doing and everyone's sort of smirking and laughing at him and then uh, just as he's about to go and it looks like he's finished he heads for the door and then he says oh just one more just one more thing and then he'll just make such a perceptive question that it just lays the whole case right open. And everyone's like, whoa. And I used to love it. I used, I used to love as a kid watching the Columbo TV shows and, <coughs> and the way he would do that. The way that he would say, oh, just, there's just one more thing. And that's actually, it's what Paul is doing here at the end of 2 Corinthians. He's written two books 29 chapters of stuff he's written it all to the corinthians and he's he's covered so much ground doctrinal ground and practical living ground he's talked about divisions and cliques in the church he's talked about moral failure he's talked about how to deal with the situation of food being sacrificed to idols whenever the guilds the equivalent of our trade unions would meet together um He's talked about marriage. He's talked about spiritual gifts, what the gifts are and the right ways to use them and how not to use them. He's talked about how we should observe the Lord's Supper. He's talked about the importance of the resurrection. He's talked about forgiveness when you've disciplined somebody for doing something wrong in the church, forgiving and restoring them. He's talked about God's glory and God's ultimate purpose is that we will go from glory to glory until we shall, we shall shine for God's glory through all eternity. He's talked about giving and the importance of giving sacrificially and how God honors faithful giving. And he's also, Paul's also defended his own ministry against those who were attacking his ministry and saying he wasn't a true teacher or a true apostle. And after covering all of that stuff, it's like Paul's finished and he's just wrapping up and ready to say the benediction. That last verse, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And then it's like he just stops and says, ah, there's just one more thing. And in verse 11, I love this. It's, it, it's, uh, it's a short verse. and so much in it. Finally, brothers and sisters, there's just one more thing. He says, rejoice strive for full restoration encourage one another be of one mind live in peace and the god of love and peace will be with you five things there that he says that we have to do and that just one 
more thing. Five things that we can have the God of love and peace with us. Five things that we can be so united together that he uses phrase, greet one another with a holy kiss, where, uh, you know, so often when people, they, they get involved with people in sinful situations and it's an unholy kiss and there's a kiss of betrayal that Judas betrayed Jesus with. But there's a holy kiss when we greet uh, one another in the love of the Lord and we're, we're like family together. He, he, all God's people sending their blessings and the grace and the love and the fellowship being with us all. For that kind of unity to happen, for that kind of oneness of spirit to happen within the church, Paul says, oh, just one more thing. Think about these five things. And those five things are rejoice, restore, encourage, be of one mind, live in peace with each other. When he says rejoice, it's probably out of these five things, that's the only one that's at all possible to do on your own. But I want to tell you this, you rejoice better with other people than when you're on your own. You know, there's times when I'm feeling a bit down and I say, I'm going to praise the Lord. I need, I need to get my spirit right. I need to get my heart right. I'm, I, I need to get lifted up in the Lord's presence. And I will start praising. I will start rejoicing. And I will get there. If I rejoice on my own, I will get back up to a place where I'm excited about the things of the Lord. I'm ready to go again. But you know what? When I rejoice with other people, I get there a lot quicker. My, my, my praise lifts me up much more when I'm praising God with other people. Because you can rejoice on your own, but you can rejoice much better when you're rejoicing with other people. And that's one thing we have to do in the church. We have to rejoice. There are things that would get us down. There are things in this world that are, that are truly astounding and how wrong they are and how sinful they are. But you know what? We, we are not called to be down. We are not called to be depressed. We are not called to be those angry, miserable people who are, who are just being, being angry at everybody else all the time. We, we're not those people. God's not called us to be those people. And the way that we avoid being those people is to rejoice together. And then we need to restore. That's what he says. He says, rejoice, strive for full restoration. There's times in all of our lives when we get it wrong. There's times in all of our lives when we mess up. Sometimes we mess up without even meaning to do so. Sometimes we try to say the right thing and we end up saying the wrong thing. Do you know what I'm talking about? If you don't, you're not married, because I want to tell you, any married person knows that there's times when you try to say the right thing, and you end up saying the wrong thing. And there's times whenever we allow our anger or whatever else to get the better of us, and we actually deliberately, we deliberately say the wrong thing. We deliberately do the wrong thing. We have to ask others for forgiveness, and we have to ask the Lord Jesus for forgiveness. And then we need to restore one another. We don't hold a grudge. We don't say, no, I want you to suffer a bit longer and for the consequences of what you did or what you said, but rather we restore. Paul, that's why, that's why Paul said to the Corinthian church, oh, just one, one more thing, rejoice, but restore. restore, strive for full restoration. When I mess up, I want there to be brothers and sisters in the body of Christ who love me enough to help restore me. And I want to restore others when they mess up. Now, hopefully we're not going to mess up too often. And hopefully we're not going to mess up in too big a way. But nevertheless, we need to be prepared to fully restore one another and to be committed to that. That we don't rejoice in the downfall of somebody else. When somebody else messes up, we don't rejoice and say, Hi, I knew they were never not as good a Christian as me. But no, we are there to restore. We need to fully restore one another. So we need to rejoice, we need to restore, we we need to encourage as well. If I was just keeping with the R's, I, I could have said we need to refresh because you know you refresh something when you put life back into it, you freshen it up. And uh, when you encourage somebody, you put courage into them. When their courage, they've been discouraged, their courage has been taken out of them. You encourage them. You put courage back into them. We need to encourage one another. 
you know, sometimes the church can be a discouraging place. And that's a tragedy when that happens because the church is more than anywhere else on earth supposed to be the most encouraging place. It's supposed to be a place where people can see that which God has placed within us and encourage us to use it and step out and develop it. And I would encourage you today to be an encourager. You know, there may be somebody who needs encouragement. There may be somebody who just needs, they may be struggling a little bit. They need to be told an area where they're getting it right. And it might be something as simple as saying, you know what, I just love the way when I turn up for church and I see your smile, it just makes me feel better. Encouragement, it's a wonderful thing. Encourage somebody today. So Paul says we're to restore, rejoice. He says we're to restore. He says we're to encourage. He says we're to be of one mind. You are always going to see things differently to some extent. But you know what? Being of one mind doesn't mean that you think the same thing about everything. But it does mean that you're pushing forward for the same goal in the things that matters. And so we need to concentrate on the things that really matter. One thing I've discovered is when I disagree with somebody, there's two ways I can look at that. I can look at it and say, this person is my enemy. They disagreed with me. They don't say thing, see things the way I see it. They don't like the way I do things. And we get defensive and we feel like they're our either competitor or an enemy. But you know, there's another way of looking at it. When somebody disagrees with us on something and they disagree enough to talk, tell us about it, it means they're interested about the same things we're interest, interested in. And I, one thing I've learned so much is by when somebody disagrees with me about how I'm doing something, is to actually sit down with them and say, you know what, it's really great that we both want the right thing. We just maybe disagree about how we're going to get there. And then we begin talking about how we can get to the place where we both want to be. And sometimes I am wrong and sometimes I need to change what I'm doing. And sometimes the other person needs to get on board with what I'm doing. It works both ways. But uh, we need to be of one mind. Now, it doesn't mean we're always the same, but it means that we're moving towards the same goal together in the church of Jesus Christ. And when we keep that in mind, we recognize that we are of one mind, then we can actually work much better, even when we might disagree over just how to do it or some issue or other. And then flowing out of that comes the final one, which... Uh, is live in peace with each other. Living in peace with each other doesn't happen naturally. It's really hard whenever we're in church and we find ourselves falling out with somebody else because we know church is not supposed to be like that. You know, you accept the fact. Other places, you're going to disagree with people. We take that for granted, but somehow we get the idea that in the church that, that, that shouldn't happen. But the fact is, we, we disagree, we fall out sometimes, we get annoyed at each other. And keeping peace and living in peace with one another is not just something that flows along, that we just all hold hands and sing Kumbaya, and the Holy Spirit means we're always at peace with one another. But rather, we need to, we need to sometimes work to be peacemakers. And Jesus said, blessed are the peacemakers. But sometimes making peace is hard work. Sometimes it takes determination. Sometimes it takes a lot of prayer. Sometimes it takes persistence. But we need to be peacemakers because the church is powerful when we are one, when we're together. I do believe that at Solid Rock, trying to bring as much of the church family together in one service is a powerful thing for being one and being together. But it goes beyond just being in the same physical space. We need to learn to rejoice. We need to learn to restore. We need to learn to encourage. We need to learn to be of one mind. And we need to learn to live in peace with each other. And I pray that God will do that. Let's just pray right now. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would take us as your people. And Lord, I pray that all the stuff that would cause us not to be at peace with each other, all the stuff that would cause us to be divided rather than being one, I pray, Lord, you would help us to overcome that, whether it's selfishness, Lord, whether it's resentment, whether it's pride, whatever it might be. Help us, O oh Lord, to overcome the stuff that tries to stop the church 
from being one. And Lord, I pray that when we when we, when we look at what really happens when the anointing comes upon the church and the church is one, then Lord, we realize the stuff that would separate us and stop us being one tends to be pretty uh, petty stuff compared to where you're taking us as a powerful church that is one in Christ Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just before we finish, uh, a few no announcements or notices I want to share with you. Uh, one is we are continuing to worship every Sunday, 11 o'clock. Uh, we don't have our Monday night prayer meeting through the summer months. Uh, so do just watch out for one another. Maybe even just keep track of each other a bit more through whether it's WhatsApping each other or phoning one another or, or whatever, arranging to meet up with somebody else in the church for a cup of coffee or whatever, because we still do need to fellowship even when we're having a few less meetings on during the summer months. Um, we are continuing with our online, all our online stuff as well. We have the online service on a Sunday. Uh, we have the online Bible study uh, upon this rock going up on a Wednesday. Uh, we have all content out, take fives and other prayers for Ukraine. We've got some, uh, we've we got words of wisdom now. It's something fresh going up on our Facebook page, which is every day. There's a, a great inspiring quote from some Christian leader, uh, either present or past. And again, that's to build you up and encourage you. So do check out all of our online material. You can access it through the website, solidrock.ie, or through our Facebook page, Solid Rock Drahada, or our YouTube channel, Solid Rock Drahada. And uh, we're continuing with our prayer as well, our 24-7 prayer. Again, you can access the link through today, Sunday, on the Facebook, Solid Rock Facebook page, or through the website. You can follow the link and sign up for an hour of prayer to as we maintain our 24-7 non-stop prayer. And we do want to thank you for your giving to the church as well. Uh, you know, uh, the Lord has been so, so good and so, so faithful and enabled us to do so much as a church and touch so many people's lives. And that doesn't happen just automatically. And, and God's people in their faithful giving is an essential part of that. I do want to thank everybody that's giving online. Uh, we do have the IBAN and the BIC number up on the screen, the stuff that you need to make an online payment. But if you prefer to pay by PayPal, uh, there's a link on the website, church website, and if you prefer it cash or check, then I would encourage you to come along to our service, at our Sunday service, and uh, we've got boxes on the back walls and a box at the front that you can, we don't hand around an offering basket, but there's plenty of places where you can give uh, and either put your cash or check in an envelope and just drop it into one of the offering Boss, uh, boxes uh, and that's perfect but whatever way you choose to give thank you for your faithfulness in the matter of giving and receiving and now I want to close by praying the same grace that Paul prayed at the end of second Corinthians uh, but when he closed those two letters that he had written to them and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us now and forevermore amen and surely goodness and mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. And we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. Amen. Mm -hmm.